So, so this morning, I encourage you to clear away the distractions of the week. And fix your eyes on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the author and finisher of your faith. He is good and his mercy endures forever. Right now is our time to connect in a posture of worship with the heart of God. So feel free to lift your hands and raise your voice and sing along with us as we worship the Lord. i 
Yeah. 
We're going to continue our worship this morning with our tithes and offerings. And you know, the Word of God says that God loves a cheerful giver, and God looks on the internal things of the heart and not on the external appearances that men look at. So if we want our offerings to be acceptable before God, we need to give in a heart that is pleasing unto Him. Amen? Not just throwing money, not just doing things for outward appearance, for what other people will think, but for a heart of devotion, gratitude, thanksgiving, and expectation in God who meets our needs. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we just ask, Lord, as we give this offering, Lord, that it would go to further your ministries, God, this church, Lord, the Dream Center, Lord, that you would continue to do your work, that you would draw all men to yourself. Lord, we just want to see people saved. We want to see people's uh, lives met, Lord God, with you, that you would redeem them and save them, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them. So, Father, with this offering, we just thank you, for, Lord, for the grace of giving, and we just want to praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So as you're led by the Lord, please come up. We have the Joe S. chest. We have text to give, the kiosk in the hallway, and also please remember the Dream Center as you give. Amen. Holy, holy, 
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of
shining upon our hearts and for the Son of God dwelling in us mightily, Lord. I thank you for your holiness that you can impart the righteousness of Christ to your people as we walk in a dark and confounded world. Father, I pray today that you would hide me behind the cross, Lord, or that the word would take flesh and come alive in our hearts, Lord, and that we will walk out your word, Lord, giving daily application, Lord. Would you bless these people today, Lord, as they faithfully came and to your house to worship you and give to you and serve you and honor you and adore you. Father, I pray your blessing upon your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, why don't you turn around and greet a few people and say, good morning, God bless you. I see several new faces today. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord. What a great day. Great to see you. I I do see several new faces today. I want to welcome you to Parkview Assembly of God. My name is Pastor Chris. I'm the senior pastor here. And our mission and our vision at Parkview is very clear. We reach up to God in prayer and spirit-led worship, as you can see. We reach out uh, into our community uh, through outreach, and we also reach in to produce fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. One of our outreach mechanisms is the Delaware Regional Dream Center, Delaware's premier community center, we believe, where we go out and evangelize and feed the community and do outreaches in local schools and also in community complexes and things have been just exploding at the Dream Center. Brother Matt will have a, a report next Sunday for you, but I want to welcome you and if you'd like to stay connected to us on the front of your bulletin there, there's a little QR code and you could take that and scan it with your phone and you could join our email list and that'll help you get acclimated when we send out emails about what's going on or you could check out our website, go to the Dream Center website, see what that's all about. You can get connected to the Dream Center and serve on our packing teams. There's so much good stuff going on here at Parkview Assembly of God and we are honored to have you with us. We do have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, there is a youth beach trip scheduled for Wednesday. I'm not sure it's going to happen because of the weather, but we'll keep parents, if you are here and you have a teenager, we will keep you posted uh, through the Remind system, Remind app. We're not sure if that's going to happen due to the weather. Uh, but also our Adopt-A-School backpack giveaways are going to be being scheduled in August. And so we have added the school down the block, Aspira. Uh, that's a, a Latino school. Five, six hundred students. So we've added that to our outreach, uh, uh, our outreach availability. So we're asking you if you could uh, bring in, if you could bring in some school supplies. There are some buckets out there in the lobby uh, that you can uh, you can bring in uh, pencils and pens and different things of that nature. If you're out and about, we would certainly appreciate uh, you assisting us with that. And then in August, we're going to have our tent revival. Our tent revival, Redigging the Wells of Revival is the name. Uh, you're going to have to take that logo off of there, Wayne. It's in the way a little bit. So Redigging the Wells of Revival. Is, we're going to have one service, one service on Sunday, August 21st. And so I'm humbly and graciously going to ask you as a 10th, uh, 830 service, would you kindly... Uh, come out to the 1030 service. It's one day during the year. We ask the whole church to come together uh, at the 1030 service and we'll be outside uh, under the tent enjoying the property and we'll be there again on Monday night. So, uh, water baptisms. There'll be water baptisms on Sunday, August 21st. If you are interested in getting water baptized, it's going to take place during the service out there at 10 30 uh, so it's going to be a wonderful time we're going to encourage our young adults and our student ministry and our kids church to get water baptized and parents if you uh, been have been baptized already and want to do it again with your children with your family 
with your teenager, I would encourage you to process that and prayerfully consider that. Uh, get baptized as a family. Uh, there are some uh, sign-ups in the lobby, so I look forward to uh, celebrating on that day what God is doing. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's all I have for announcements, but I'm ready to get into the Word this morning. Are you ready for the Word of God? Amen. All right, let's uh, stand to our feet to respect the reading of God's Word, and I'm going to ask you to open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 29. We're talking about Jacob the last week and this week and next week. This is an old message I had that I've redone. So if you've been here for any number of years, and some of you have been here longer than I, uh, I've, I've preached this once or twice before, but I added a couple new uh, additives to it. We are in Genesis chapter 29, and we're going to be going to verses 1 through 18. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of eastern peoples, peoples of the east. And he looked and he saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in the place of the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where, were you, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. And he said to them, Do you know Laban, Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And so he said to them, Is he well? They said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel, check her out. She's, she's coming right here. Look at this. She's coming right down with the sheep. And he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together, for they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we, then we water the sheep. And now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban's mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth. He was like a he-man. He said, honey, I know the well is closed, but check out these muscles. Watch this. It's okay. We're gonna, we'll get your sheep taken care of. And he pulled up the stone and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his brother's mother. Verse 11 says, Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice up and wept. He was actually looking for a wife at this time. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father, Laban. And when it came to pass, when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him, embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him to his house. And so he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he stayed with him. Jacob stayed with Laban for about a month. And Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, you should therefore serve me for nothing. Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. And the name of the older one was Leah. And the name of the younger one was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were delicate. But Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, uh, here's the deal. If I serve you seven years, I want to ask for Rachel's hand in marriage. And that's where we'll stop right there at verse 18. And let us pray. Father, I thank you for our times we're walking and talking and heading in all sorts of directions. And I thank you that you meet us right where we are at at times, Lord. And I pray, Lord, no matter what these people are going through today, may they have an encounter with the resurrected Christ that will lead them on the pathway to their destiny, Lord. I pray for all of those that are searching and seeking for you. May they find you in a more meaningful and exuberant way. Father, bless your word this morning as we break open the bread of life and feed from it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. 
I titled the message, you may have heard this one before, Rowing Into Your Destiny. That's why I have the rowboat up here. And we pick up this week with our buddy Jacob as he connects with Laban from his family tree. And he sees Laban's beautiful daughter, Rachel, and he's ultimately overtaking with a little bit of desire. He's like, oh my goodness, this girl is beautiful. And we'll unravel the events from the Bible today, and we'll realize that our destiny is in the hands of God. We can all, at times, make some not-so-good choices. Have you ever made a not-so-good choice? Yeah, I've done that on several occasions, probably two this week. But I love this part of the story in that God can redeem our mistakes and put us back on course and reorient our steps into his perfect will. Are you with me? I'm going to teach you some Hebrew today. Uh, it's, it's, it's a longer message. It's not a short message. It's a little bit of a longer message. Uh, I love this scripture in Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. God is describing who he is. And he says, remember the former things of old. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God says, I know the end from the beginning. I've written the script. Just like in a movie where uh, someone goes and uh, auditions for a movie part and they receive a script. Uh, God said, that I've, Chris, I've written the script of your life. Now you just have to get a hold of it and walk in my perfect will. When he uses the word end in this scripture, uh, I know the end from the beginning, the Hebrew word is akarith. It means the last or end or henceforth the future. Or uh, in Hebrew, when you would, when you would, uh, each, each word has uh, pictures attached to it and letters have pictures attached to it. And, and there are different interpretations as you go deeper into Hebrew in God's word. And, 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 and in Hebrew, the word akarith, it, it means that, that which is behind you is actually what is ahead of you. So if I was in a rowboat or in the Olympics and you were doing the synchronized rowing and you were rowing towards a certain direction, that which is behind you is literally that which is in front of you. Make sense? Are you with me? So uh, this is what we're trying to have you ascertain, that sometimes you're in the boat with Jesus and you have to keep your eyes fixed on Christ because if you turn around and see the storms and see the obstacles, you're going to go try to go around them when God has positioned you and empowered you to go through the obstacles in life. So it's important that faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You don't have to see everything. Usually God gives me a little bit at a time. There's been times when he's given me the whole plan. Here's, here, Chris, here's the next year and a half. And I take his plan and I go, thanks, God. I'll talk to you when I need you now that you've given me the plan. You ever been there? And so sometimes, most of the time, he gives you one step at a time. He says his word will be a lamp for your feet and a light for your path. In coal mining, the, a lamp illuminates only the next step. Are you with me? All right. I was watching the Olympics over the summer last year, and they had the synchronized rowing. And there was one man in the boat that called out the cadence, row, row, row. And they were in sync with the captain of the ship. See, God has a plan for your life. And... The Bible says in Psalm 139, he formed you in your mother's womb. He handcrafted you. For what? For what he's called you to do. So the Bible says that you are handcrafted, specially made with gifts and a purpose to accomplish what he set forth for you to do. God didn't create you with void so you can't accomplish what he's called you to do, Right? Scripture revealed that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. 
And when we deal with looking ahead into the future, as I mentioned, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus and walk by faith and not by sight. Because it, it, God sometimes doesn't show you everything, amen? He just shows you the next step in the process. We see in our text, Jacob was rowing by sight. He comes walking by and he goes, whoa, who is that Judy Paduti? Hey, girl, what's your name? Oh, you want to you wanna water the sheep? Girl, did you see these muscles? Let me help you out here. Come on down here, sweetie. He takes off the water your sheep. Can I give me a little? He says, give me a little kissy poo. He was totally being led by the flesh. He was looking for a wife, and he made no qualms. Hey, he was, his, 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 why? he was like, oh, my goodness, this girl is beautiful. He gets back to the camp with Laban, and he sees Leah, and he says, she's a, yeah. the Bible, she's, she's cool, but Rachel, oh, my, a chihuahua. This one, she's, she's a hottie. This is what the Bible is saying here. Sometimes um, when we're led by our emotions, when we're led by our line of sight, uh, sometimes it can get us into a predicament, as it did with Jacob. I'll unravel the story. Sometimes when we encounter hardships in life, when we encounter hiccups, when we encounter uh, stumbling blocks, uh, we get discouraged. Anybody ever get discouraged? Yeah, probably twice a week, right? And we row into storms, and we row into obstacles, even some spiritual warfare. They could be relational with our family. They could be physical. As you get older, these bodies just start to break down in ways unknown. Hips and eyes and cataracts and all sorts of things. When you hit 50-something, things just start to go downhill, Amen. Knees and tendons and ligaments and back, I just can't figure it out. I'm trying to figure it out. But on top of that, the physical ailments that we face as we get older, we face relational obstacles and spiritual obstacles and different things in, in our job, in our workplace, if you're still working. Remember that the Bible says, if God is for you, who can be against you? That's Romans 8.31. I want to encourage you not to get discouraged when you come across obstacles because God himself may have put that obstacle there not to hurt you, not to discourage you, but to strengthen you. The Bible says that in the Old Testament, the Amicalites and all the ites that were in Moses' way, God said to them, they are going to be bread for you. Your enemies will be your bread. What does that mean? That the obstacles and the challenges we face should be a source of strength to get us through and push us into our destiny. I always thought the opposite. I thought, well, the devil's putting these obstacles there. This, I must, I'm probably going to have to go this way. And God's like, no, Chris. I need you to go through this challenge. Not around not run, not go the other way. I've orchestrated some things to show your enemies that I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? God is a God of the underdogs. The situations and circumstances in my life and in Jacob's life begin to dictate what truth is, and it sets us up for what the Bible calls hope deferred. The Bible says this in Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hey, when you're rowing in the boat and you got storm after storm after storm and challenge after challenge and children and grandchildren, just physically and emotionally, relationally, maritally, you're like, oh my goodness. Like, is this going to get, all of a sudden, <laughs> the hope that you had begins to dissipate. You ever been there? Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when desire comes, it's a tree of life. I've been in situations where I've been discouraged, and I, I've, I've, I've sensed there may be no way out when problems arise. Sometimes you feel like you're rowing against the tide. Jesus could have felt that way, but he knew that his heavenly father had a plan. Paul 
oftentimes encountered a spirit of fear, uh, setbacks and discouragement and obstacles, uh, but he kept rowing into his destiny. They stoned him with a lot rock in Lystra. I don't mean stoned him with marijuana. He got stoned. I mean they took a rock and bashed his skull in and left him for dead. But he did not discourage him. They took him to a jail in Philippi and beat his feet and back with the, with the scourge and whips. And, but it did not discourage him. He kept going on into his destiny. He didn't say, oh, God, there's too many obstacles. You must not be in this. He said, no, God, this is a definitive footprint of you, your leading. See, if you read your Bible, you'll realize all these obstacles, they were there to make Paul stronger. Each and every one he faced made him stronger. Despair or desperation is a dangerous opponent. It leads, us, leads to regret being sown in our lives, and regret often leads to frustration. I've been very careful as we row into our destiny with the Dream Center, not allow frustration to arise. Let me give you the Webster's uh, definition of frustration. A deep and chronic sense of insecurity and dissatisfaction arising from unresolved problems or unmet needs. So anytime I get frustrated, I'm like, do I have any unresolved problems? that I've swept under the carpet that need to be dealt with? Do I have any unmet needs? Because if the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength, why am I frustrated? Am I saying, God, you're not giving me your best, and I don't like these challenges that are coming my way? I don't like the trials and tribulations. Well, guess what? Better buckle up, buttercup. Sometimes it doesn't get better. Sometimes God will strengthen you in the storm. Sometimes I've had to let go of the losses and establish a new supply line in Christ. Jeremiah 29, 11, we know this, we quote it, we live it. For I know the plans I have for you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. evil to give you a future. That word in Hebrew is akarith. I'm giving you an akarith and a hope. He's saying, don't worry about it. I've already pointed you towards where you're supposed to go. Chris, get in the boat and start rowing. But, Lord, there's a storm. So what? Peter said the same thing. Lord, oh, my God, there's a storm. He said, come on, Peter. I bid thee come to me. Oh, I can't. Lord, is this to Peter? Stop looking at the storm and keep your eyes on me. And as soon as he stepped out, he began to what? Be a water walker. You were called to walk on water. You were called to walk on your storms and rise above the situations. It's embedded in the Bible, in Daniel, in Nehemiah, with Joseph, with Moses, with Joshua, with all of the New Testament apostles. It is embedded in the prophets, in Hosea, and, and, and Daniel, and Ezekiel. The, the, the Bible is just overloaded and packed with men and women of God who've overcome obstacles. We, church, have to be more than overcomers in Christ Jesus. We get tired of rowing sometimes. Anybody ever get fatigued? We were just talking about it, right? Sometimes you have to just pull up the sail and set your sail to the wind of the Holy Spirit. We had a great week this week for VBS. I want to thank everyone that helped. Can we just thank them? Thank you so much, everyone that came out and helped. We had an army of people. 90 to 100 kids out every night, and by Wednesday, Michelle, I was like, oh, 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 I said to my wife, if the Lord doesn't help me, I'm not going to make it. Everything hurt. Cranky personified. Advil and Tylenol were not working. And I just walked the dog on Wednesday night, and I said, Lord, everything hurts. And you didn't call me to be cranky and miserable, so you need to lift this off of me. I just, you know, if I'm overdoing it and I put too much and this is a result of my own selfish ambition, then take it all away. But I need you to strengthen me. I went home. I woke up Thursday morning. I was like, not there. It's not there. It's like, we'll see. Let's go through the day. <laughs> And I got, like, my joints didn't hurt, my knees, my back. I was like, praise God. And I had this jump in my step all day Thursday. It was almost like he renewed me. I got up on Friday. You had the same thing happen, Tony? 
Because we were, we, were, uh, we were grinding it out this week. Friday, the same thing. Friday, I got up and I said, Denise, I'm going to take you to Dr. Dave Cook, the chiropractor. And we're going to get your, you aligned and your hips and everything. Just trust me. It, it will take. So we went to Dr. Dave and he popped, snap crackled and popped the hips and everything back into alignment. And we came back Friday night. We were like, yeah, we're good. We're good. We're, we, you know, we used a little wisdom, but we called upon the Lord. Right? God had a plan, but we had to continue to row. And, and you know, the devil was trying to discourage me. And I said, devil, <laughs> I'm going to tell you one thing. We had 95 kids in here worshiping the Lord. And I will show you the highlights next week. We're working on a little video. I'll try to send it out via email also. But those kids that were worshiping strengthened me. Our, little, our Lord's like, do you see this? Do you see the eternal imprint you're leaving on their lives and we had an altar call for accepting jesus we gave away some prizes the kids were engaged every night and it became a source of strength a source of strength for us and i told the devil devil you get in my way i'm not going under you i'm not going over you i'm not going around you this year i'm going through you and you're not going to stop us at the same time the dream center was blowing up the uh I mean, in a good way, blowing up. That's the vernacular of uh, good things in, in today's culture. Uh, the University of Delaware football team came down to pack boxes of hope with, their new, with the athletic director. He loved the Dream Center, right? And then we had another church come down from Middletown that were helping do outreaches. They packed 150 boxes of hope. We had the leadership from Aspira School, right, Lewis? Come down and do a walkthrough. These ladies were in tears, that we can help the Latino community at the school. 70% are under the, uh, they're, they're in need, let's just say that. 70% of the school is in need. They have food insecurity. And that was only the beginning. So many things happening. Matt Meyer the, uh, uh, put out, sent me an email and said, hey, there's $54 million available in grants to nonprofits, so get your pen filled with ink. All in the midst, just a wave of God's goodness, a wave of God's grace, a wave of God's strengthening. Let's go to the New Testament and see what the New Testament says about this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God, our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. And here's the key word, the next one. Having predestined us into adoption. That means, I don't know what these other denominations and the Mormons think. The Mormons think you were chosen before the foundation. No, God gives us a free will. From Adam and Eve, we have a free will. You can choose to follow Christ. You can hear the gospel. You can respond or not respond. But if you do respond and say, I want to be part of the family, and I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, God's word says he adopts you, and the moment you get adopted, the plan goes into effect. He says, I had a plan for your life, but first you got to become part of the family. And when you ask Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, that plan gets activated. You are predestined. He says, now you're in the family. Now I can plug you in to Akarith, to your future. That word predest predestined there is pro oritio in, in Greek. Pro meaning towards. Oritio is a derivative of the horizon. Orizio, horizon, it's where, you know, anybody got Verizon, Fios? Yeah, that's another headache, but. So, Verizon, horizon, pro Orizio. God says, I've pro pointed you towards your horizon. All you got to do now is get in the boat and get to work and head towards what I have for you. Well, Lord, I thought you were just going to drop a pot of gold out of the rainbow. That's not going to happen. Yeah, there's blessings along the way. But there are things you've got to put your hands to the wheel of ministry. The things you've got to put your hands to the wheel of life. He says, I have already pro-destined you, brought you into the family. I've purchased you. And his purpose then begins to unfold. 
I'll give you an example. This is an amazing story. Some of you heard it already. Wayne, put the picture of my old church up there. That's Denise and I's old church in Staten Island. So back in 1983, I was uh, 13 years old. Six, so I was about 15, 15 years old or so. And me and my mom drove by this church. We were going to the Staten Island Mall. We were going shopping. She had a Sears credit card. You know, anybody ever have a Sears credit card? It, it's like, you know, we were rich. We went to Sears on Friday night. Praise God. I get new sneakers and new school clothes. So I am in the back of her 1978 Chevy Nova. Remember the Chevys? Chevy Nova? It was a white four-door Chevy Nova. And we're driving this way, and I remember it was a cold October evening. Don't ask me how I remember it, just the Lord. And I had my nose pressed up against the window of the back of the Chevy Nova. And as we passed this church going south towards the mall, I said to my mother, why do I feel like I'm supposed to go to that church? That was it. God put that in my spirit. I was born again at a young age. And I went on. 84, I graduated. 86, was in trouble. 89, <laughs> wound up leaving college, going to work for Pepsi until it was about 2003. I rededicated my life to the Lord after being away from him for 12 to 15 years out there in the world. And I'm coming from the Staten Island Mall in 2003. One first one was 83, 93. 20 years before, 20 years after, I'm coming in my Acura, a green Honda Acura with my best friend Tommy, and we stop at the light going this way in front of the church, and I look out, and the Lord reminds me of what he said 20 years ago. And I said to Tommy, I said, why do I feel like I'm supposed to get married in that church? He's like, you're nuts. I said, I'm nuts for Jesus. And we just went along our way in 2003, Meanwhile, I meet this cutie named Denise. She's my Rachel. I go to this coffee house in Staten Island, and there she is. And I'm like, Jacob, oh, my goodness. It's like, hey, girl, can I get your number? It's like, you want to go out on a date? I said, yeah. She said, meet me at my church on Friday. I said, sure, where's the church? the church so I walk in it's a Friday night service this is right after 9-11 so revival's breaking out I mean this the, the church grew from 200 to 2000 not not at that point yet it's it's 2004 at this point it's a year after I drove by with Tommy she invites me into a Friday night service I come in there I sense the presence of the Lord is so thick and I look up I start worshiping and I hear the Lord saying, I've just positioned you into your destiny. And I'm thinking, oh my God. And then he brings back 1983. And he brings back the year before. And I thought, how did you... No, I didn't know Denise and I were going to get married. A year and a half later, we would get married by Pastor Russ in that church. A year and a half after that, I would go on staff at that church. It was the nation's 45th largest church. We grew to 3,000 people. But God had a plan for my life. Even after you screwed up those 12 years, Pastor? Absolutely. Because the Bible says he redeems the time. He redeemed. I, could, I, could, I messed up here in 1982. And, God, and I wasted 12, 14 years. God went, let me just, Chris. Let me put you up here where you belong, and I'll give you the marriage, the house, the kids, the dog, the picket fence, and all those good things, because I'm not in time. I created time, Chris. I could redeem what the canker worm stolen. That's what he does. That's what he does. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God did what? He pro oritioed. He pointed me in my direction. Chris, there it is. Walk in it. Well, I'm, I'm not sure, Lord. How could you not be sure? I showed you 20 years ago. I was like, you're right, Lord. I'm going. People come into this church and they say, 
I drove by. The Lord told me to come here. I walked in. I knew I was home. I knew, the, well, I think, Diane, you were just telling my wife in Coles yesterday. You saw Denise. She said, we knew as soon as we walked in the door, God said to us, this is the place I'm to be at. Because that's when you walk into your destiny. And God illuminates. So you just have peace. You just, I know. But, and that doesn't mean the enemy's not going to throw the kitchen sink at you. That means he might just go all out to eject you from the place you're positioned in. So don't read the terrain wrong. Well, if God sent me here, all should be. There's well with my soul. It might be. It might not be either. So don't misread the terrain. Come on, somebody. Ephesians 1.11 says this. In him we also have obtained an inheritance being pro oritioed according to what? The purpose of him who does what? He works out all things according to what? The counsel of his will. So once I'm in the family in covenant, God said perfectly, now I could get a hold of this Chris Dito character and I could propel what I showed him in 1983 with his nose pressed against the back of his mother's 78 Chevy Nova on that cold October evening heading to the Staten Island Mall to go shopping at Sears with the only credit card we had. God decided to reach down from heaven and show me something that was 83, 93, 2003, that was 22 years in the future. How does he do that? I don't know. He's God all by himself. He, the Bible says, according to the purpose, purpose in Greek is thesis. <laughs> Me and Herb, God already wrote a thesis on you. Here's what Herb's supposed to do. Here's what Cordell was supposed to do. I got it all down. And uh, hey, one of these angels sent him the script to reveal my plans for him. Anybody ever go to college? You have to write a thesis. What is a thesis? It tells why something does what it does. You have to prove. What is your thesis? God says, I already wrote a thesis for you, Chris, because I've given you gifts, and the gifts I've given you are going to enable you to carry out my purpose. You've been handcrafted, Psalm 139, in the womb to do what? To first come into his family, to be adopted as a spirit of sonship, to cry out, Abba, Father. And then once the a, a spirit of adoption has taken place, you say, I'm part of the family. God says, boom, I'll activate you into your destiny because I've already prothesis you. I've already wrote the script. And in writing the script, I've already formed you, Psalm 139, in your mother's womb and gave you the gifts to do for what I've called you to do. He doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> Amen. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and row into our destiny and row into our future by faith, not by sight. I didn't know how we were going to pay for the Dream Center. I didn't know. I didn't know we were going to get $320,000 worth of grants that we barely even asked for. But God has a plan. And once you step into that plan, he opens up the floodgates of heaven and prothesis you. He begins to provide. Ecclesiastes 6, 9, here's what happens to Jacob. Watch this. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. It is also vanity and grasping for the wind. So we know Jacob from last week. His name is Yaakov, supplanter, deceiver. He's a trickster. He stole the birthright blessing from Esau. We talked about the showdown last week with Esau. And, and, and he's still a conniver. Are you with me? God still uses him. Can you believe that? God still uses me, and I'm not perfect. I mean, I'm not a conniver or any of that, but, I mean, I'm still yes. in the flesh. I'm not perfect. So he, he, he rolls up to the well, and he sees Rachel, and he gives her he hits on her, and he gives her a kiss. And Laban says, come on, come on back to, to, the, to the ranch. You need a job? What, what, what can I pay you? And he says, or over there. She's worth her weight in gold. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. You work for seven years, and I'll give you my daughter Rachel's hand in marriage. He said, seven years? He said, seven years. He says, let me think about it. Yes. He didn't think long. So that's where <laughs> better is the sight of the eyes than the one that his desire got him in trouble. But God still redeemed it, right? There are times when we row into our destiny, and God has to encounter um, 
he, he enables us to encounter some not so attractive things as we wait for his divine purpose to unfold. Before God releases some things in our life, there are times that he calls us to embrace some difficulties. So watch what happens. He works seven years. He t labors and tills the soil, and seven years is up, and he's like, Laban, let's start the ceremony, bro. My biological clock is ticking here. He says, okay. He got, they go through the whole ceremony, this Jewish wedding, and then he goes into the tent that night to consummate his marriage, if you know what I mean. And he wakes up in the morning, oh, Ah! He looks, and it's not Rachel, the cutie patootie. It's Leah. And he flips out. He comes out, Laban, Laban, you, you, you tricked me. Well, how do you like it, trickster? You, 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 you deceived me. You told me to work for seven years, and I would get Rachel. And you snuck Leah into the tent, and now, oh, my goodness. He says, that's too bad, my friend. In our culture, we marry off the firstborn first. You're a beat. What do you mean? He says, too bad. This is how we, this is how we roll in Haran. And he's mad. He's like, what do I have to do for cutie patootie over there? Rachel, come on, bro. He's like, work another seven years. Let me think about it. Sure. We're talking about 14 years of work for the desire of his eyes. But in that time of the next seven-year waiting process, he embraces Leah. The Bible says she's not so pleasant to the eye. Not sure what it means. But he and Leah not only conjugate their marriage, but she gets pregnant. Let's go to Genesis 29. 32, Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called him Reuben, in Hebrew, Ruhabin, for she said, the Lord has looked upon my affliction, and now, therefore, this guy's going to love me and stop looking at my sister over there. And the Bible says, she conceived again, I guess things are going in the right direction, she conceived again and bore a son. And she named him Simeon, or Shimon in Hebrew. She said, surely the Lord has heard that I am unloved, and he's given me a second son. But I guess they weren't done then. <laughs> and then she conceived and bore a son again. And now, she said, now I'm pregnant with Levi. Levi in Hebrew means to become one with. And that's where the Levitical priesthood would come from for, for the thousands of years to come. And she said, surely I have borne thy three sons, and my, husband's, my husband Jacob will now become one with me, because I'm going to name this kid Levi to become one with. And through all of this, I want to teach you something. There are times when you're heading into your destiny, and God brings some challenges along the way. Them challenges and those disappointments and those discouragements like Jacob encountered were not, were not designed to defeat you. They were designed to draw you closer to Christ. He encounters Leah and births something. The first thing he births is Reuben, which means in Hebrew to see. The second thing that gets birth is Shimon, Simeon. It means to hear from God. The third thing gets birth is Levi. It means to become one with God. Are you telling me, Pastor, that along my destiny, God will send some challenges my way, some not so pretty things, circumstances and situations, and out of those things, what gets birth is your ability to see God from a clear perspective, to hear from God with clarity, and to Levi to become one with God. And if you do, and if you understand God's ways as you go into his destiny, you won't misinterpret the landscape, you won't misread the landscape, 
you'll say, oh, this is a, so like got a, a, a boss or someone in your life that's just like drives you nuts. That's your Leah. I don't know who or what your Leah is. It may be a wayward child. It may be a grandchild or something. It may be a work situation. It, it may be a physical situation. It may be a spiritual situation. It, it, it is a Leah that comes your way. And God said, before I give you your be the best, your heart's desire, I need you to embrace some tough stuff. Have you ever been there? So that tough stuff is designed to what? Produce a Reuben to hear, a, a, a Simeon, a, a Reuben to he see. A Reuben to hear, a Levi to become one with. And all of a sudden, Jacob gets down. He's just like, you know what? I'm not even sure I want Leah, Rachel anymore. I'm just going to, God, I'm going to praise you in the midst of this ugliness. And he lifts his hands to the Lord and has another child. And the last child he births, she births, is Judah. And Judah means to praise. When you start praising God in your difficult situation and circumstance, it's only then that God will. allow you to become one with me until when until you put your hands up and you surrender and say send judah jesus comes from the tribe of judah now you get it and it's when you praise the god praise god in the midst of your storm god further releases you into your destiny and finally he gets done judah gets birth and the 14 years is up and finally He's like, oh, Rachel, they have the ceremony, and they bear the last two kids in the kingdom, which would be Joseph and Benjamin. We're going to talk about Benjamin. That's Rachel's kids. Joseph and Benjamin, those complete the set, the 12. I do like 12. No thanks. Michelle's like, I got, I got, I got enough. Right? I, I barely can handle one. She has 12 signifying Hebraically governmental structure, a full set, 12. Government in Hebrew is 12. This, is, this would be the, 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 the launching pad for the Abrahamic covenant to be fulfilled. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel. Now they'll be as multiple as the stars in the sky because the, the launching pad is happening right now when Rachel gets released to birth the 11th and 12th child. So you got it up there. You understand. See, I want you to understand God's activity in your life. So many times, we blame the devil. Please stop blaming the devil. It, it, it could be, God could be using the devil, allowing the devil to, you know, cause a storm or cause some heartache. But don't give him too much credit. Because God ultimately is sovereign. He is large and in charge. He's extra large, like a dozen eggs, which are now $4.99. Anyway, once God challenges Jacob to embrace the Leah, the not-so-pretty item, and then he praises God for it, then God begins to release into his destiny his heart's desire, which is Rachel. Our fleshy desires are oftentimes need to be crucified so that the resurrected Christ and his purpose for your life becomes clear and paramount. I didn't mind breaking my back this week. I didn't mind going home exhausted because I called upon the Lord to strengthen me. And I saw his hand, I don't know, my muscles, my bones, my body were just strengthened. And by Thursday, I was like, man, this is no ibuprofen. I was like, praise God, because I had to embrace a challenge that, you know, it was physical, it was mental. It's like, we're short a youth pastor, we're short a kid's church director. And I told Denise, but God is still on the throne. And if we call upon him, he will empower us to reach the fruit we need 
to reach and produce for Jesus Christ. Let's stand to our feet as the worship team comes. I want to ask you, are you rowing into your destiny? Have you ascertained or the, the New Testament scripture I love, I think it's in Philippians, lay, to lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of you. God has a plan for your life. And just because, please hear me, just because Leah shows up, just because, and here's the most important thing, the takeaway. Just because Leah shows up doesn't mean you are in the perfect will of God. You hearing me? Please hear me. Just because challenges surmount and arise day in and day out, one after the other, after the other, after the other, don't misread the landscape and the hand of a sovereign God. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, folks. You were created on purpose for a purpose. And there are times when we get discouraged and hope deferred comes in. Can I tell you? Shake it off. Shake it off like I did this week and say, no weapon formed against me will prosper. It's going to be formed, but it's not going to prosper. Because I'm going to walk into my destiny. I'm going to be strengthened by the Lord. I'm going to see the Lord clearly. I'm going to hear from him distinctly. I'm going to become one with him. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and ultimately to do what? To praise him in the midst of the storm. And once I start doing that, the devil's like, even if it is the devil or if it is the Lord saying, you know what? Now he's ready. Lord told me a few weeks ago, stop complaining. Stop complaining. I was like, pardon? Stop Stop complaining. I, get, I could take this all away, Chris. And I'm like, oh, oh okay. Thank me for the, for the trouble. Thank me for the pain. Thank me for the challenges. Because it's in that that you're going to get to know me better. And I'm like, hallelujah. Bring it on. Bring it on. Hallelujah. All of these difficulties made me Christ-like. You understand? They conform you into the image and likeness of Christ. That's the purpose of the trial. That's the purpose of the fire. Will you walk through the valley? Or do you just want the mountain? Sometimes you got to go through the hard places. And there you will learn... He named one of the kids, uh, can't think of it. I'll give you feet like Heinz feet. Ru Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Issachar, Asher, Dan, Neftali. It was Neftali. He said, I'm going to give you feet like Heinz feet. Because when you're climbing up the mountain, you're going to have to keep jumping and jumping. You'll never get to the other side if you don't do the climbing. So let me pray for you as we go. Father... I thank you for your word. I thank you for who you are. That, Lord, you would open up the heavens and allow the Bible to become clear today. That the challenges we face are either allowed by you or sent by you or whatever the source is, Lord. I pray they don't take us off course regardless of the source. Allow us to lay hold of that for which you laid hold of us. We love you. We thank you. Lord, we thank you for the Leahs that come into our life right now. Just thank the Lord for the Leah that's in your life, the challenge that's in your life. Start to change your perspective and say, Lord, thank you, Lord, for this, this challenge, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that in this trial, in this place, Lord, of struggle, in this place, Lord, that I'm not getting what I think I want, but I'm getting what I need for this moment. Lord, change my attitude, Lord. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Lord, as they row into their destiny, Lord, I pray that the prophetic fulfillment of Christ Jesus would come over their hearts and homes, Lord, that you would point them in a direction that's so clear, that's so crisp, Lord. Whether it be this church or another church or another ministry, Lord, allow them to lift up a shout of praise in their home and in their hearts, Lord, that they could clearly see your hand of grace in their lives. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer, as Jeremy closes, I'm going to be down here uh, uh, if, if you need prayer or guidance. I'm going to position myself here to pray for you. As Jeremy closes with the worship team, feel free to worship. Feel free to go. If you need prayer, I'm here also. Okay, go ahead, Jeremy. What a power.